Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and this, this probably is gonna be a, a nice, intimate conversation. So I'm Lucy Appert from the Columbia <coughs> Center for Teaching and Learning. And we have a great panel here today on open educational resources. Uh, I first got interested in open educational resources when I started teaching more than 20 years ago, trying to find things uh, for students and negotiating what was possible and what was not possible. When I first started teaching, it was a lot of photocopying. So we've come a long way. Um, I just wanted to say two things about changes that I've seen in open educational resources. First of all, is um, I uh, also serve on the board of an open software foundation, the Perio Foundation. And one major shift that I've seen in the past five years is the membership in our community has moved from being focused on a learning management system as the place where educational resources are made and shared, um, which is a gated, closed community, to um, individual types of platforms, such as video creation platforms or um, learning module collection platforms. And I think that MOOCs do have a lot to do with this because um, faculty members are starting to imagine the things they make for their classes as having a life outside of this walled garden and being something that they could distribute. The other thing that I wanted to say is that um, at the Center for Teaching and Learning over the past year and now running again, uh, the MOOC that we made with Eric Foner, the Civil War and Reconstruction MOOC, was actually created from the very beginning as a source for of open educational resources, particularly for um, teachers, uh, high school teachers who would be teaching the subject area. Um, Eric Foner, who will speak tonight, um, has done a lot of work um, in teacher education, and this course was imagined as something that could supplement teaching. So I think, having said both of those things, to see the powerful role that open educational resources have started to, that MOOCs have started to, to make. I'll introduce our um, panel today. We have Mary Lou Forward from the Open Education Consortium. We have Timo Coase Co 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 from the University of Delft. Um, and we have TJ Bliss from the from Hewlett Foundation. Uh, and so they are going to share their ideas and then we're gonna have a, a larger conversation about OER. So Mary Lee, you wanna start? All right, so I'm Mary Lou Ford. I'm the executive director of the Open Education Consortium. And I've been really happy to hear all the talk about open educational resources today. This has been really fantastic. And we've heard a lot about how people are incorporating OERs into their MOOCs or creating MOOCs and then turning them into OERs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that we have been working on this year to intentionally use already existing open educational resources and turn those into MOOCs. So we can start um, with a quick definition of OER just to make sure we all know what it is we're talking about. And OERs are teaching and learning resources, uh, including research and data, that permit their free use and repurposing by others. So they use an open license. These are created by educators who have intentionally said, use my resources, modify them, make them better, make them stronger. Um, this is an intentional building of an educational commons upon which we can all draw. We make a big distinction between free and open, free meaning no cost, and open meaning no cost plus the ability to modify. Or in other words, open educational resources provide access and adaptability. And the reason that we do this is to provide a basis on which innovation and improvements can be made in education. So those of you who were here earlier and heard TJ speak about the importance of pedagogy and that OER is not a means, uh, is not the end goal, but OER is a goal on which we can establish a platform to make um, the changes that we all want to see in education. So who we are, a quick introduction to the Open Education Consortium. We are an international organization of universities and other organizations that support open education. A little over 300 members right now. We are, exist to support openness in education. That is our sole goal. And we have members from around the world. We're very global. About 25% of our membership is from North America. The rest is from outside of the United States. So this is really a, a global movement. Collectively, the members in our organization have produced and released over 30,000 
either partial or full open courses. So you can find these online right now. And this is why we looked at this great body of material and said, what next? What else can we do with these? And to give you an idea of the kinds of resources that are out there, there is everything from complete textbooks to videos. For example, this is a lab video for chemistry. So this is a how to support that goes into a course to lecture notes, assignments, um, activities, the kinds of things that teachers actually use in the classroom and their notes on how to employ them. Simulations that can be embedded in courses or used directly by students. And materials that were created specifically to fill a need. So this is uh, workbooks created by Scottsdale Community College when they found that students actually needed an additional resource to be able to understand the textbook in their class. So they said, why are we ordering a textbook that our students can't understand? We're going to make a, a workbook that includes those concepts but also brings them up to where they need to be and then we'll release this to the world. And then finally, of course, full courses. And this is a course from the University of Michigan. And it has the CC BY license on it, which <coughs> means you can take it, you can use it, you can modify it, as long as you give attribution back to the University of Michigan. And this is the entire course. So those are the kinds of resources that already existed. And one of the frustrations that people felt in the OER and the open education worlds was that there was a lack of interactivity with this material and that one of the wonderful things about teaching, obviously, is your ability to connect to people, but that these resources were resources and that they were being used to connect to people, but they weren't actually being employed online as much as we would like to see. So we said, what can we do? How can we partner with the MOOC movement to make these resources a bit more interactive? So we said, why, are, why do we want to do this? Why do we want to promote uh, open educational resources as basis for MOOCs. The first answer was it is an opportunity for us to use the interactivity, the data, and the pedagogy represented uh, by MOOCs as, an, as a way to see how we can increase the interactivity around OER. The second was to combine the idea of open enrollment in MOOCs with the idea of open content and open licensed content from the OER movement to create something stronger that had the best of both worlds for open MOOCs. And that many of our members really wanted to participate, but they weren't sure that they wanted to fully commit as institutions. And I showed you the map before. We have institutions from around the world. So we're talking about um, institutions, say, in Africa or in Asia, who really wanted to try a MOOC out, weren't sure what platform to use, weren't sure that they could get the support ready to do that, and, and weren't sure that they were ready to commit fully as an institution. So this was a way for them to test the waters and to see if MOOCs was really for them. And then we selected OpenX, oh, uh, sorry, edX, because they are built on open source software and that fit our mission. So we went to open, uh, we went to edX and we asked them if they would be interested in this and they said that they were and then the Hewlett Foundation provided us with some funding to, uh, to get the project started. We offered this then to our members and said we would start a pilot of 10 MOOCs for the year. And the 10 MOOCs we, we selected for diversity because we really wanted to test what would happen from different institutions, what would happen from different institutional types, and what would happen from different languages. So we had a university from Japan, from Taiwan, uh, two, two from the US, one a community college and one a university, Spain uh, and Taiwan. And the two that were done in languages other than English was the Taiwan uh, energy course done in Mandarin and the one, two courses actually from uh, University Politecnica of Madrid who did it in Spanish. We, after they developed their courses and they have all run right now, we actually have one that just started but every, every other MOOC has completed. Um, so we did a survey with them and we asked them particular questions. We wanted to know did using OER actually make it easier for you to create a MOOC than it would have if you had made these materials completely from scratch? Did it help cut your time to develop the MOOC and did it help reduce your costs? And then what were the benefits of doing an open MOOC to your institution? So we asked those questions of the MOOC developers. What we found was that the time to create a MOOC is still significant that even though they started with OER, there was still a significant demand on people's time from the uh, instructional designers to the course facilitators to the higher level administrators. One of the things that was the biggest time was 
create, recreating the videos. And a lot of that was due to changes in the platform and changes in requirements, such that the video that had been created as OER earlier could not be directly repurposed as video in the MOOC. We asked them, how much did you use OER as your base? Did you really use all of your open content to create the MOOC? And what we found that it was a bit varied, that it was 25% to 100% new content created. That 100% new content created means that they reshot all of their videos. It doesn't mean that they created a new course or a new subject, but they actually went back to their open resources and said, none of our videos is actually gonna fit the platform in the way that we wanted to, and so we have to reshoot it all. Lower costs to create MOOCs was associated with higher use of OER. So that uh, hypothesis actually came true, that if you reused and repurposed materials that you already have openly, it, it reduced your cost to make it. Um, the cost did depend on the modification of materials. So the low end was $6,500, and that was by the community college, and the high end was $100,000, and that was by the U.S. University that reshot all of their video. Um, it did include all of the staff time and the resources necessary to do that, and that the video, no surprise, was the most expensive component. So we asked also about their institutional impact. What, what did doing these MOOCs mean to you? What, what did that do for your university? What we found is that several of the universities um, have updated their open content. So they've actually substituted the content that they had available in their open repositories with the materials that they, that they made for the MOOCs. That Hokkaido University in Japan actually created two versions of their MOOCs, one in Japan and one in, oh, sorry, one in Japanese, one in English. The Japanese version they have used in their classes and they've used on their open pl uh, portfolio in Japan and it's created a lot more interest in their open portfolio. The community college relied very heavily on materials that were mixed from a variety of different institutions. So that actually helped to drive their institutional strategy. How can we remix open materials for our online courses? And would that be something that we wanted to do in the future? And then the course that was developed by the Open University was specifically for teacher education in India. And what they found is it actually really pushed their mission by um, greatly increasing the number of teachers they were able to reach through their content. So we also wanted to look at what was the impact that we had on our organization. And what we found out was um, that the format of open educational resources has a big impact on how well it incorporates into MOOCs. And so now that we have that experience, we can put out some best practices for developing OER for people who want to then turn those into MOOCs. That the process obviously is very evolved, uh, or very involved, and it is evolving. Um, and that's true whether you create the materials from scratch or whether you use existing materials as OER. Um, that the time required in communication back and forth as kind of the middleman organization was fairly significant for us, and I'm sure your project managers have found that in your universities as well. Um, but we also found, unlike I think a lot of universities, that the open MOOCs didn't really serve a strong marketing purpose for either our organization or for the universities that were doing them through us, that they weren't as visible as if someone was featured as a partner right on the homepage. So our preliminary conclusions from doing this project is that OERs can indeed provide a very solid base for developing a MOOC and that we would love to work with people to figure out how to find and reuse existing open resources as a way to streamline some of the costs required to develop a MOOC. Uh, we'd, we think that we need to do more work on the formatting of our OER. As I mentioned before, we have best practices that we can now put out there for those who are developing OERs specifically to be reused as MOOCs. Um, that MOOCs do, in fact, provide that interactivity for the open educational resources we were hoping that they would. And that chunking the content um, is really important. That's a lesson very strongly learned from MOOCs that the OER movement can uh, can take a lesson from, that in a lot of cases, lectures were recorded in their entirety, and we all know that people don't watch more than a few, vi few minutes of video, so that was reinforced through this project. Um, and then we also found that the openly licensed content can be more readily repurposed by the institution itself. So that was an important uh, finding that I think uh, is valuable for other institutions to think about. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go on to Timo, but thank you very much, and we'll be happy to take questions afterwards.
Hi. Um, I'll try to keep it short as well. I just show you a few slides on what our open policy is in uh, Delft, Delft University of Technology. Um, and we've been very active in the um, open education uh, um, uh, world. Um, I think some of you might know uh, our board member, Anka Mulder. She's been president of the Open Course and Consortium. And um, as Delft, we've been involved in open educational res resources since 2006. Um, and now I will show you just some things that we're doing currently um, with our MOOCs and open e educational resources. Um, one of the things last year is that we've created a um, plugin for the Open edX platform where you can easily mark your content as open educational resources, give it a Creative Commons license. Actually, this was done by a student startup company that we uh, funded. Um, and they uh, won the edX hackathon in the Open Education Week. And this is uh, Willem Valkenburg, who's currently on the board of the Open Education uh, uh, Consortium. Um, we've been very active in MOOCs. Um, but what is maybe interesting for you is that all our MOOC videos and course materials are published as open courseware. So we publish them on edX as a MOOC, as an integral course, but then besides that we publish the videos, uh, the syllabi and all coursework separately on our own open courseware uh, website, which is on our website, um, and everybody can use them. Um, but that gives a lot of... Uh, questions that you need to ask about your licensing model. Um, and this is our general license that we use for all our MOOCs. Um, what is interesting also is that uh, we as a university own the IP of all uh, MOOC contents that are published. So our faculty don't own the IP of their um, work published in w and, and made with the help of the university. We are a publicly funded university and we are very, very active in the whole domain of open science, so open access, open source software, um, and open educational resources. Um, and it hasn't actually been a big debate. So this makes it easy for us to have a general policy that every faculty member who wishes to publish a MOOC on edX, they, um, well, they publish it with an open license. What is uh, important is that it is open, you have to attribute, you can remake uh, it, but it is non-commercial. Um, because if we don't make money with it, nobody else may do that. Um, then we started to venture into sub-licensing, which is uh, a difficult topic to think about. If you have openly licensed your course material and somebody asks you, can I re reuse your complete MOOC um, in uh, a new setting? Um, and we'd like to pay you for it. Um, what are they paying for? Um, we did this with edX and edRAC, and we also done it now with uh, Tang X. that's another um, version of uh, the edX platform. And there's some others that are interested, but we needed to make a new model where if you openly license your content, and everybody can use it for free in a non-commercial way, how do you think about relicensing something in another uh, educational context where it might be used commercially or even non-commercially? Um, and this is a model that we used and we developed it into this model where we differentiate between the contents and the services that you provide on top of it. So we've licensed complete courses to other platforms that are used in other um, uh, languages. And we are actively involved in the quality assurance and in the giving of feedback in the training of um, teachers that are teaching it they are uh, in, in, in the other language. And what we also didn't openly license are our exercises. We are a technical university, so most of our exams are quite straightforward. Um, so once you've opened that up, you're, uh, well, you, you lose <laughs> your exams, especially to our own students. They can find it easily. So, the videos and the texts and all the contents are licensed openly. Everybody can use them. But if you want to use it in an educational setting where you also use our quality assurance and our exams, we put in an extra license and we negotiate in how far we will be involved in the delivery of the course content and the complete course in another language. So I think this is an interesting way to think about the way 
open educational resources can be used to enhance access as content, as resources, while if you build it up to a complete course with interaction, with social interaction, and with quality assurance, there is time involved of people, and that costs money. So you need to have a form of licensing that will allow you to uh, get a fee for the time that you have to spend each time again when people are entering that course. Okay, and So I don't have any slides, so I don't earn the right to stand at the podium. And um, I, we probably should have said this is more like um, a symphony, so no applause needed between movements. But it's OK. Uh, so I think it would be good for me to set some context and help you understand um, b before I make remarks. and. Um, Maybe this will be a bit controversial, I don't know, but I like to speak in metaphors, and this is a metaphor I've been thinking about when it comes to OER, to open educational resources, and to the term open itself. Um, I'll use the metaphor of, of the church. Um, the Pope was just here, and so that's appropriate. Uh, if, if OER is a religion, <laughs> if open is a religion, then Hewlett is the Vatican. Um, and Creative Commons is the is the the canon of Scripture, I suppose. Um, the, in terms of orthodoxy, Hewlett's very orthodox. Orthodoxy, um, it's a high level of orthodoxy when it comes to open, um, as does Creative Commons, and we and we hold the we try to hold the line and hold the pole on uh, the most open license, a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, that doesn't mean that we disagree, that I disagree with people using different versions of the license, like putting an NC clause, or even uh, perhaps MOOC providers not even making open MOOCs, uh, if there's a reason to do that. If there's a, a, a business model requirement that prohibits the use of, of an open license. So I want to I set that clear, kind of where I come from. And, and like Mary Lou explained, what open means to someone who is an OER evangelist, Actually, I've heard that term elsewhere, so that's probably where I started thinking about this metaphor. Um, there's a strong missionary zeal around o openness and OER. And there's, a, I think, one of the tensions between OER and MOOCs um, has come up because I, there's this fear of open washing. There's this fear that among the OER advocates, among the, among the church of OER, let's say, that um, people using the term open in less than orthodox ways only makes it more difficult to talk about and help people understand what what we're trying to say about open and open educational resources. And so with that as context, um, I'll just say a couple of things uh, as it relates to MOOCs. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns about open educational resources. Uh, the reason that Hewlett's still funding it is because not everything's known and it's not a sure thing. Um, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of things that have happened. I mean, the Secretary of Education, uh, Arnie Duncan, who I don't know if you know, resigned today or will be resigning in December. Um, last week was finally talked about open educational resources um, on their back to school bus tour. And that was exciting. And, and the White House is talking about it. And governments around the world are talking about it. So there's momentum around open educational resources. But it's not a sure bet. There's limited research about the impacts of openness on, um, on the economics of the educational endeavor. There's limited research about the impacts of open on, um, on student outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of theory, and there's a lot of hypothetical. And there's still a lot of risk, I would say, which is why big philanthropy is still involved with it. Um, we think there's a lot of potential there. So I'll say that as a caveat. And so I'll say I don't, I don't know what the value proposition is of open licensing for MOOCs. Um, Mary Lou gave some great data, uh, not all of it shining, about the value of, of openly licensing a MOOC. Um, if your business model relies on selling content, then open licensing may even seem like a threat. So I think that there's, I think there's a lot to be learned. So I would say that we need a lot more understanding. We, we need a lot more things like um, the project that Mary Lou is doing, um, the work that you're doing at Delft. 
I think is um, there, there, are, there are anecdotal things and there's a bit more data growing. One of the best anecdotal um, pieces of evidence that I've heard actually comes from Delft about the value of an open license for a MOOC. And it relates to the water treatment MOOC. Is that the drinking water safety? Is that what it is? So you'll correct all my erroneous facts because it's been a year since I was there and, and heard this um, from Willem. But they produced an openly licensed MOOC um, on drinking water safety and water treatment uh, intended for people who actually need to do that to survive. And um, my understanding is that, that, that it was taken by uh, people in, in Indonesia. Yeah, Indonesia is a, pro a, pro a Dutch province, a Dutch. No, well, it was. I mean, there was a connection. There's a connection between, between the Netherlands and Indonesia. And there's still a strong ago. connection there. There's still, I think there's still <laughs> things there. This is from Willem. Yeah. Uh, so, so, they, so, they, so they were paying attention to what was coming out of there. And they took this MOOC. And, and somebody took it and translated it, which is something that you can do if there's an open license. Um, I don't know. I don't see the, the lawyers in here anymore, so I don't know where that falls under fair use, <laughs> whether they had rights to license and redistribute. But I highly doubt it. That's a, that's a huge modification, and then they redistribute it, and they actually shared it back with Delft. And so, people who, the producers of the MOOC, were not intending specifically to help end users, beneficiaries, receive benefit from that particular MOOC because it was openly licensed. So there's things like that, and that's the case with. With, um, with OER in general. We see that happen a lot. Um, it's a lot clearer. The, the value proposition of open educational resources is a lot clearer uh, when it comes to things like open textbooks, where there are real costs associated um, with students paying money, where there's apparently there's an $800 textbook now. I'm still trying to verify that, but I heard that last night at dinner that there's an $800 textbook out there. Um, we were freaking out about the $400 textbook last month. Um, there's a vicious cycle going on as textbook prices go up. The number of students, especially, I'm not talking about necessarily students at this institution. I'm talking about students at community colleges, students um, who are at much higher risk of dropping out on average than students in, the, in major universities. But uh, as the cost of textbooks go up, the number of students, the percentage of students who purchase or acquire the required text for a course goes down which means that the margins go down for the publisher, which means they have to raise the prices, which means that fewer students next semester end up buying the, a new textbook, which means the margins go down, which means the textbook prices go up. And it's, it's, it's this cycle that will have to end at some point, but it hasn't yet. Uh, and so right now, there's an opportunity for um, lower cost options, and there's all sorts of things out there. But the open option has this appeal to faculty, and it's a growing appeal, not only because it's reduced cost, but because of what they can do with an open textbook that they can't do with a publisher's version, a proprietary copyrighted version. Um, the opportunity to adapt uh, to, um, if the platform's right, if the technology's there and they can cut out chapters or reduce the amount of content or anything like that, um, we're, finding, we're finding that faculty are, are, are attracted to open textbooks, particularly because they are, um, there's, there's a chance for new pedagogy there. And they see that. I don't, I don't know yet if that's the case with MOOCs. Um, the, the, the technical requirements of, of changing and adapting and revising and remixing video is different than for an open textbook. So I guess all of that is to say is I don't know. I don't know about the value proposition of open for MOOCs. I, uh, you know, sitting at Hewlett, um, I think I like to believe that there's a value proposition there. But I'm also cognizant that, that there's, there's still a lot to be learned. So I don't know if that's uh, that what you were expecting for me to say. I don't know if I've shocked um, my, my no. panelists. <laughs> but that's, that's where I'm sitting right now, trying to figure out what the relationship, the real relationship between OER, open licensing, and MOOCs <clears throat> should be, if there is a should be, and, 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 what it might, and what it might look like, and how we might figure it out. So that's my presentation. There you go. You don't have to clap. Did you want to respond to that, or? Um... Well, I think it depends on the, um, the the goals that you've set yourself with MOOCs. I mean, if you have a multiple uh, uh, have multiple goals, most most universities have. Um, it can be a, a, a value proposition. I mean, we've set a goal to um, to enhance our uh, the, the quality of our campus education, to educate the world, to share our knowledge and um, to increase our academic output. Those are the three goals that we're working on. And if 
you share your knowledge with the world, that's something that is uh, of int intrinsic motivation for our, our faculty, then open uh, contributes to that. I mean, uh, you, you open up access to your, to your course material, to your knowledge. Um, it's, it's knowledge dissemination, so then it helps. Um, and especially if people start uh, amending it and, and connecting to you because they've seen your material, they've uh, gotten to use it in their own uh, uh, way, that, that can be very fruitful. We've had this uh, example of Indonesia, we've had it from Vichy, where there was a water company using the same MOOC uh, for all their employees. Um, and they started to do a research with us, a research project. So it, it can help you in that area. Um, but th those are indirect um, benefits. Um, but if you're just looking at choosing between a business model where you have IP and uh, where you have revenue on IP and openness, then it's a difficult decision. I, I have a question for the panel. I have actually two around this value proposition. So um, the first one, and I should add to the people here, there was a kind of prequel to this discussion um, in the sustainability panel earlier this morning. And uh, one of the questions that came up there was, um, how, what, how do you pay for content? How do you, what's the reward for the creation of the content? And so um, I think one question that I have about for, for the panel is um, if we think about um, the fac faculty work in research as something that they are not really paid for, right? You don't get paid for journal work or really very much for an academic publication. But there is a kind of credentialing that happens through the research analytics and through your um, status that you achieve, your number of citations. We've gotten much better at figuring out what your Google score is. If there is a payment in research, there is a value, right? You get paid more for every book you put out. Um, can OERs um, with proper analytics, um, proper whatever for use and efficacy, could OERs help us set up credentialing in a similar way for teaching? So that's part one, and I wonder your thoughts on that. Okay, so everyone's looking at me. Um, <laughs> yes, I think, you know, we have a lot of examples from the early producers of open courseware. Um, when they put their materials out there, their general visibility increased quite a lot. And that then drove uh, rec more recognition within their institutions. Because there was all of a sudden interaction with the general public um, in a way that hadn't happened before. So figuring out the way to value that uh, hasn't really happened. Um, yet, and it should be, and of course the, the constant thing we talk about um, is the tenure and promotion system, and how that could be potentially modified to include an openness factor. Um, as one example I'll put out there is that one of the newspapers in um, Korea that ranks universities, a few years ago decided to include openness as a criteria in their university ranking. And those universities, um, there's Seoul National and there's Korea University that are often in competition for some of the top, the top two or three spots. Um, and Korea University had an open courseware, open education program. Seoul National did not. And so in that one year, just that little additional weight that was put on open pushed Korea, Korea University ahead. Um, and so those kinds of things, those little incentives that could be formally built in, if credit could be given to people for openness, for their willing to contribute to the educational commons, and that can be formally recognized uh, in the ways that you're talking about, that would have a huge impact on, um, on open, uh, open uptake. So I am where I am right now because several years ago I became very frustrated with this very thing about how much weight is put on teaching in the tenure and promotion decision making, um, about how little care was taken in even in measuring effectiveness for teaching. Uh, I'm talking about student ratings. And that kind of led me down this path that eventually led me here. Um, in a long, circuitous way I'm not going to describe. But I've thought, of, I've thought about those issues for a long time. And, and the, the, arg the, arg I the argument we had this morning, it was a little tense, um, about this issue. Who's going to pay for content? And can we ever change the system? And is it even worth trying to do that? Um, I, think, I think that this is, 
this is something that needs a lot of consideration. It needs a lot of thought to think about new ways of content development. And, and, and Timo talked about that. Maybe you can speak a little more about um, the idea of in institutions collaborating around content development. But I'll just say one thing. If we, if we just think about the public sector, the, institution, the public institutions of higher education, and if we apply the, the principle of openness to that, and this, this is the principle of openness that, I mean, this is like the core doctrine of Creative Commons when it comes to open policy, and one that I will reiterate here, is that publicly funded materials should be publicly available in the most open way. And uh, if, if that is followed, then that would mean that any materials created by an employee of a public institution should be by law publicly available. That would be the most drastic version of this. But that would require new funding models because people should be compensated for that. So I've heard, um, I've heard an idea. I'll throw out one idea. And, and are any of you legislators or policymakers in here? No. OK, just raise your hand if you are, because if not, I can't say this while you're in the room, because it would be considered lobbying. But specific legislation that paid faculty upfront for producing content. So flipping the royalty model to the upfront production model. Um, say, for instance, say this, the state of California decided that they wanted to leverage the huge higher education system that they have there and the thousands and thousands of really top tier faculty to produce content, to write textbooks, whatever it is, and established a fund to do that under the principle of publicly funded materials should be openly licensed, that would that would go a long way toward, toward solving this issue. Now, there are a lot, I mean, this is a, it's an idea, right? And I don't know what all the contingencies are and where that funding would come from and things like that. I'm not like saying we need to raise taxes or anything like that. I'm just saying there, we, we, we need to think about this a lot more because I think that there are ways to do this um, that, that aren't obvious right now and, and that may require some creativity. Uh, and, and maybe, Tima, you can talk about one you were mentioning earlier in the earlier session. Yeah, and, and I would like to get back to the earlier question about the value. Um, the increased reputation of our faculty members was clearly uh, an effect of uh, the early open courseware that we published. Uh, now that it's been uh, coupled to MOOCs, it's all starting to filter into our promotion system. So mm -hmm. we're seeing the first uh, professor uh, being named this year who has been an excellent researcher but wasn't there yet to be a professor, and he's now being promoted to being professor because of his excellence in, um, in education. And it, it's easier to rank your impact and to, to uh, benchmark your quality um, if it's online. Um, so that's ha having a big impact now in our institution. Um, but still, it's the, the number of, uh, the, the amount of open courseware that's out there is still quite small. I mean, we've published 130 courses, into integral courses. Um, but we looked around for our um, first bachelor year uh, math courses to, to use open material on calculus, linear algebra, and all, all those kinds of things. And it wasn't out there. So if you want to teach your own students using open uh, courseware, it's very difficult to find the right material. So that needs a coordinated action. So I would love to make an alliance with other universities to, to start creating this type of content that can be reused by everybody in their own uh, campus education. Um, but that needs coordination, um, because nobody can uh, fund, probably, the creation of a whole curriculum uh, for all your courses. That gets me to the to the second part of my question. Um, in in our earlier session, uh, one of the things that TJ argued was that the thing itself, the OER object itself, has no real value. Um, it's really how it gets used in that pedagogical context of use. And so I wonder um, when a lot of times you can talk about the production of OERs, um, but we often know you know we have students who produce many things and they're still kind of C plus things, right? So how do we contextualize um, OERs in terms of pedagogy? Can we begin to create models of excellence in pedagogy using OERs as a context, or even using OERs as a kind of model where we can show how things are done well? So the, can I answer that one? Unequivocally, yes. <laughs> and there are several examples. There are not quite a thousand points of light yet on this, but there are, we're getting there. 
Um, and there are examples in K-12, and there are examples in higher ed, um, these, these pockets of places. Is it happening at a systematic level? And that's a different question. So it, how do we do this systematically? I don't know. But can it be done? Absolutely. So a couple of examples that I, I'll just reference, and you can go look them up. Uh, murder, mayhem, and madness. Just Google it. It's a wonderful course um, in uh, the University of British Columbia that addresses this very question of, of, of open educational practice, how you use open education um, to have students and faculty together co-create content that is extremely high quality. Uh, another one is um, David Wiley's project management for instructional design. And I'll tell you a little bit about that one. That, that example was, uh, <clears throat> was addressing the need. Uh, there, was, there was no textbook for project management and instructional design. There were a lot of textbooks for project management. So how to move you know, projects relating to business and other areas. So David was able to find a textbook. And I, I don't know if he acquired the rights or, or found an open one. Um, and spent two or three semesters having his students, the whole work of the course, all they did was improve that textbook to align it with the course objectives of instructional design. So in the first semester, they went through and took out all of the non-instructional design examples and put in instructional design examples. The second class took it and um, added assessments. The third class took it and aligned it to the standards of the Instructional Design Association. Um, there's a whole series of things, and David blogged about that. So those are two instances. And, and a third one um, in K-12 with seven seven-year-olds. So there's always this question of, sure, that will work, because those are both graduate level courses. Sure, that will work well with, with graduate students. So this, this is an example with seven-year-olds. Um, this is work by Expeditionary Learning, which I believe they're here, New York-based. Is the old New York-based? I don't know. Um, they, uh, the model that they use is completely based on open educational resources. And they take students through, a, a basically work, walk them through an art project where they um, are guided to create extremely high quality work that is then distributed throughout the world. And, and if, when you look up, look up their, um, we can, I can tweet it out later, but the, the expeditionary learning work um, that the students did on snakes, they did a, a storybooks on snakes, but, but working with resident artists, working with biologists, working with, um, with others, these students, all of them produced works of quality that I couldn't do. Uh, and, and did video and, and did uh, audio and um, did writing and all of these things. And the whole goal there was that they would create content that actually has value out there. Uh, and, and, and they did it with seven-year-olds. So it's, it's possible to do. Now, the broader question of how do we do that at scale, that this, this gets back to, to um, the, the keynote this afternoon about what sorts of things scale well and what sorts of things don't in terms of pedagogy and instruction. Yeah, so I would also say that um, OER has sometimes been used as the way to get faculty to rethink their approaches to teaching. So we have led workshops and seen workshops where you go in to look at how you could substitute OER for paid materials in your classes. And it inevitably ends up, sometimes intentionally, sometimes it just leads there, um, what's your learning objectives? What are your goals for the course? And gets the professors to kind of rethink as they begin to divorce themselves from uh, aligning their learning objectives to the texts that are available. And instead, aligning the learning objectives to the core concepts that they really want to transmit to the students or that the students really need to understand to be able to build their future education. And when that freedom begins to shine, um, you begin to see a lot of pedagogical in, uh, innovation happening. It also allows the professors then to be able to respond with just-in-time interventions because they have an idea of what resources are broadly available. When they see students having difficulties, they don't have to rely on a narrow set. They've got a broader, uh, a broader set to draw on. Um, so it's, it's not that OER is driving the pedagogical change, not at all. But it's an excuse for people to look at the approaches for education and begin to align resources to their actual goals rather than aligning the goals of their course to the resources that they have purchased or that they have recommended for students to purchase. Maybe to add something to that, that is that uh, because of the MOOCs, 
uh, our open educational resources have become bite-sized. And it's much easier to integrate a bit from uh, a, an online lab or one virtual game in your courses. So we had a, a wonderful course on the ethics of climate change. And the professor who has been producing his open courseware himself, but these were really hour-long lectures, uh, web lecture casts, he's been using all kinds of materials from MIT and other uh, uh, MOOCs in his own courses. Um, and I think it will make it easier to rebundle all these beautiful produced materials um, and, and create a new context where you can use them. So that's one of the other things that I like about the MOOC revolution. It's, it's making it uh, easier to integrate into your own pedagogical model. Do we have questions? Yeah. Hi. I have a question about the NC restriction um, that gets put on. On the one hand, it makes a tremendous amount of sense that one doesn't want if one is not making earning revenue on one's content to allow someone else one doesn't want to allow someone else to earn revenue on that content if one is not. And on the other hand, I don't know. Um, so, for example, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is like if you Google any proper name or if you Google any place name, chances are Wikipedia will show up in its first in the first two results. Three, and if you go into that article, there are a lot of links. There's a lot of content. But the content that's in there can only be content that has where where it carries the most liberal license possible. It seems that Wikipedia would be a phenomenal um, what uh, at, um, platform promotion, for open educational practice. Something like that. Whatever he said. <laughs> so, and and I wonder I wonder I wonder in that light like how much we're losing. But, and by the way, the Lucy, the, the uh, and Lucy mentioned the Eric Foner, all those videos carry the NC by you know by, uh, CC by SNC license, which means that theoretically for that MOOC at least we could join your consortium. I don't know, maybe for that. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I just wonder about the missed opportunity there, ultimately by forsaking this liberal license with an eye toward restricting someone else's putative profit make? Well, we tried using uh, the wiki model in the Netherlands for open educational resources. It was a big project funded by the government. It's called WikiWise. Um, and it didn't fly. Um, and it was not about the non-commercial, because there was all kinds of uh, licenses uh, uh, there. But the biggest problem was that it was intended for teachers to reuse uh, educational materials. And they didn't use it. Um, and that's what we see with our op own uh, open educational resources. 85% is individu individual learners using it. It's not teachers. So there's a thing that we need to understand. Why don't teachers use other um, uh, resources made by other teachers? I think that's the biggest problem we have to solve. So but at the same time, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because that was that was the other example that was in my mind. Um, Wik Wikipedia, so the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs Wikipedia, had, had the exact same thought that you did uh, several years ago, three or four years ago, and decided to start a little pilot project internally. Said, why, why can't we get educators to use Wikipedia content um, in an open educational pedagogical way, so in terms of having people create content. The murder, mayhem, and madness example is actually a Wikipedia example, but it was done by <laughs> an innovative faculty member. So they started this pilot project where they would <clears throat> actually work directly, Wikipedia would work directly with educators to create a course around a set of Wikipedia articles with the goal of having students edit, create, contribute, uh, and improve Wikipedia and the, and the knowledge base that's there. Uh, and, if they, and the idea was if they were successful, they would spin out. So several months ago, this year, they spun out. And it's called the Wiki Education Foundation. It's located in San Francisco. And their work, their entire work, is to help support faculty in using Wikipedia in, in an open way. Um, it's fascinating work. Um, it's just starting. But they're having a lot of success um, working directly with 
with faculty. I think I think there's a there's a corner that's being turned on Wikipedia where it used to be the thing that you weren't allowed to cite in class. It's it was it's still the first place students go. If they're not allowed to cite Wikipedia, they still go there first to find the sorts of things that they can cite um, in their work. So it's still the source of, of information. But now it's being realized by a lot more faculty than before that it's actually uh, there's actually a practice here, a pedagogical practice that's possible. That's exciting. I don't think it solves the problem of, of, of educators using other people's materials and the not made here phenomenon. Uh, and I don't know what the shift needs to be there. I, well, I think one shift needs to happen in, in, the, in places like this and in, in, in places where teachers are, are, are taught, you know, where, where teachers become teachers first. Um, so that you can make that shift out. And we're talking K-12. With higher ed, I don't know, because there's, there's often not that opportunity. You have to do that in service. <laughs> you have to find ways to. I, I, I would add, actually, just as a side note to this, so I'm the mother of a 10-year-old who has been in the New York City public school system. Entire life has been under Common Core. My son has never had a textbook. And, and he's in fifth grade. So I would say that a lot of this is happening on the ground, um, that you know, every, pretty much everything that he's had has been open educational resources in his class. And so you know, when you have a group of people formed like that, it does kind of change. And you have an initiative like Common Core, um, which works against textbooks. Um, it does cause the kind of people making decisions on the ground. Mary Lou, did you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to address specifically the non-commercial <coughs> part that you brought in because that was a, it continues to raise a lot of discussion within the open education world about whether or not uh, non-commercial is really open education. And I think just to reiterate a little bit what TJ said, those of us who are really into this um, would advocate for the most open license possible because you never know the great things that can happen when you really openly share. And the more restrictions, the more restrictions. And um, that may eventually limit somebody from doing something really fantastic. So we would have always advocate for the attribution license. On the other hand, I think Timo brought this up, faculty don't see that. And it's scary enough to openly license your materials without going all the way to full open at the beginning. And so sometimes the non-commercial clause makes the most sense for that reason. And we don't say no. We don't say you can't do that, because if that's what gets you to take the steps into open, great. Um, and so we do have kind of a come on in policy, but I think ultimately we would really love to see people go to the full uh, attribution only license. Can I add a bit of nuance to that before we go to this question? Um, so there, there, going back to the things we know and the things we don't know, um, there are, <clears throat> if, you, if you put an NC clause, we, we know that putting an NC clause, there are known instances of, of disadvantage or, or even harm that have come from that. Um, there, are, there are yet no known examples of, of NC protecting anybody from anything disastrous, right? So, so the arguments that get made about NC, the comforting arguments that, well, it protects anybody from taking my work and making a profit off of it, that actually hasn't happened yet that I know of. Maybe somebody has seen that happen, but we don't, we don't know of any examples where that's happened, though that's often the case that people make. We do know of several instances where people have wanted to go do some amazing, fantastic things that the, that the initial producers were never going to do. It was not something that they wanted to do or were going to do, yet they prohibited anybody else from doing it. So there's this, there's this interesting dynamic around <clears throat> protecting the things that you might want to do and then this whole universe of things that you would never even think to do that you are preventing people from doing by putting an NC clause on on that material. Now, I agree that there are reasons to do it, and, and one of them Mary Lou brought up, and, the other, and so I don't fault people for doing that or, or, or think that they're even less open, perhaps. Um, some would argue that the NC clause makes things more open because then nobody can ever charge for anything related to it. So well, that was our argument. And yeah, that's... that's convince our faculty members because yeah. it, 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 we, we don't enforce it. I mean, we don't have the means to enforce it, and we don't check it. But it's just uh, a clause that will help us uh, keep it uh, that way. Because if you just openly license and anybody can do anything with it, they might adjust something and then put on an, an, an NC clause themselves. And you've lost it. So that's why we put it on. 
and we'll yeah. keep it like that forever. And, I've, and there's other arguments that by putting the NC clause, it's basically a forcing mechanism. If somebody wants yeah. to use it commercially, then they have to contact you just in a regular copyright situation. And in many cases, people will say, go ahead. Yeah. We do so. Yeah. So if you contact us, you can use it for free. It's, it's a way to find out who's using your stuff. So that, there's the, there are good arguments about this. So good question, Peter. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Mark, uh, and uh, I'm a product designer here at the university. I build ed tech products, and I'm on the front lines here. I'm constantly in between this tension between open and closed. You know, like working in academia, you know, a lot of times when I build a product, if you like metaphors, I've got a ton of them for you. I love uh, metaphors. It's like building a ship in a bottle. I have this beautiful thing that I've built, but it goes nowhere because it's hermetically sealed in the university and it never sees the light of day again. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be altruistic and it's very, I'm going to think open. And a lot of times when I'm looking for open, for OER in my experiences, it's akin to browsing a consignment store. You know, things don't fit, things are a little wonky, some things just plain suck. I mean, you get what you yep. pay for. So I have to, because they don't solve the particular educational problem that I'm charged with solving. So I have to go back to a, a custom tailored bespoke solution because that's my job. I guess my question is, as a, as a designer, how can you help me approach my next project by looking at open as a primary concern rather than an afterthought. You know, how can I manage this tension between tailor-made and off the rack and, and, and still walk away with something that I'm proud of and that the client feels that solves the problem too? So that makes me think of um, a couple of things. Um, one is a recent study out of MIT from the, the Innovation Lab that, sh that this is not about education, but just about things, mechanical things mostly, that the vast majority of innovation that happens out there, the tailoring of stuff, is done for personal use and is never shared. <laughs> so building a little tool that fits your car, that you know, it's those sorts of things. And it's an enormous amount. You ought, you ought to, it's an Eric Von Hippel study. You ought to read it because it's fascinating. There's, there's definitely connection to MOOCs and other things. Um, the other thing it makes me think about is that you're exactly right. That that this this the the learning object, the the consignment store metaphor is a good one. Um, is is something that the OER field kind of realized about 2009, 2010, and which has really fueled the open textbook movement, because the textbook is this is this thing that people can understand, and they can it's kind of a framework they can use. They can adopt it wholesale and say this works for me. And if it doesn't work for me, it's at least a a, a plug and play sort of solution. I know that's not what you're talking about because you're building things way beyond or di different from a textbook, perhaps. But that was sort of the impetus for the open textbook movement. It was like, look, the vast majority of people are not going to adopt OER if it's in consignment store fashion. It just doesn't work for them. But but they will adopt likely more likely to adopt a a textbook, something that they understand. Whether the textbook is the future or not, it doesn't matter because it's the present and it's what people use. So those are just some random thoughts responding to that. But I, you probably have something more intelligent to say. <laughs> well, no, I think you've hit on one of the challenges that we really have in the OER movement, and that is um, partly it grew up um, as a very siloed effort. So Delft has its resources on its site, and MIT has its resources on its site, and there are a lot of different sites. So it's not incredibly user-friendly because there isn't a single portal entry to finding OER right now. And the metadata is very inconsistent. So in some places it's categorized by department level, environmental studies, and other places you can actually get down to what are the specific um, topics of each unit. So we have a lot of work to do there to make it much more user friendly. We know that. It's a big problem to, to solve now. As I mentioned, just within our uh, membership, there's over 30,000 courses. So imagine metadata tagging all those 30,000 courses. It's enormous. Um, we are aware of it and trying to work on it. I don't have an easy plug and play solution for you, other than I think once, you know, like anything else, once you start working with it, it becomes easier to find. It's the first steps, and it's often why we, when we do workshops with faculty, we, we say the first thing you should do is just substitute out your images for Creative Commons images in your slides. That's the first step, and once you start doing that, then you realize it's actually not so hard to change my default to open. And once I change my default to open, that becomes the first filter. And so you do an exhaustive search to find open. 
And once that's exhausted, then yeah, sometimes you do have to go through a, a different thing as we were talking about. There isn't, there are gaps in the curriculum right now. We still don't have every subject as thoroughly covered as we would like with open resources. Oh yeah. Do you remember your question? <laughs> so I, I'm just gonna throw something out there and let you guys respond to it. Um, so at the moment I work at a university, but I spent a couple of years teaching at a public high school in New Jersey. And after that, I was w working with USC and I got sent to many public high schools. And what I found again and again were environments that were openly hostile to allowing students meaningful access to anything on the internet. The legal environment was so fraught that they created obstacles that made any kind of digital engagement for their students almost impossible. Secondly, <coughs> especially in large urban districts where finances are extremely tight, the way that districts solve problems are by buying in supported commercial products that are often highly scripted, that deprofessionalize teachers, but that have some money attached for a couple of years. And we're gonna all retrain our teachers and we're gonna do this thing. And so the teachers end up without the, you know, the professional capacity to say, look, let's do something different that's better, that's more about our students that helps them to get you know, where they are. Now, are there, you know, are there exceptions? Sure. PS87 does some amazing work here in Manhattan. I'm really, you know, pleased I sent my own kids there, right? But that's, you know, you get a few good ones, right? And then you get an awful lot of places that, unfortunately. So how, how, can, how can we turn that tide <coughs> so that we can convince school districts and schools and administrators that there's enough value in this that they should rethink. Hmm. Can I respond to that? Because I'm mm -hmm. working in K-12 on this. Yep. You can you throw, chime in as well. But So it's a great question. Uh, and it's something actually we're thinking a lot about. Uh, Hewlett, um, the OER community is thinking a lot about this right now and doing a lot of things as well. Um, you've hit on some really big issues like um, teacher professionalism. Um, which is a personal passion of mine, um, the, the lack thereof in this country particularly. Um, and a lot of it actually I, I ascribe to how the content has been produced and what teachers have been expected to do, um, especially in the last 15 years uh, under the current um, federal laws that we have, uh, have contributed a lot to that. Um, the lack of connectivity, and even when there is connectivity, the idea that, um, that there's a lot of protection around wh what students can even do. Uh, so, so what to do about that? There's a couple of things happening right now that are really exciting and, and potentially risky um, uh, re related to, to potentially breaking the procurement, the, the <laughs> breaking, it's bro the broken procurement model that we have or the entrenched procurement model that we have sort of changing that. Um, it's a really hard thing to change, probably harder than even the faculty tenure problem we were talking about. It's even more entrenched. Um, but the, the, a couple of things that are happening right now um, are the, 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 the work of Engage New York. Do you know about the Engage New York work? So New York um, got raised to the top dollars and used it to actually um, fund the creation of content, all of it openly licensed. Um, aligned to the Common Core, is responding to this lack of materials available for the Common Core. Um, and what we're seeing is that uh, it, this material has been, a, has been downloaded more than 25 million times. It's been adopted wholesale by the Denver School District, by a, the second largest school district in Florida, and we're starting to see people adopt this material. And with it, they're adopting new pedagogical models because of what you can do with this content. And what's gonna happen in three or four years when these school districts go to procure content again, uh, they're going to realize, if they don't realize it now, <laughs> they're going to realize, oh, we don't, we don't have to pay for this content again. We can, we can actually enable our teachers, we can spend the money, the part of the $6 billion a year that school districts spend on content, we can spend that money on actually having our teachers come in, our teachers, our very own professionals, to come in and update 
content where it needs to be updated, realign it if standards have, new standards have been adopted, they can realign it. If you can, ima can you imagine a world if we had had open educational resources as the default type of material, openly licensed materials in our school districts, our public schools, when 45 states adopted the Common Core, um, it would have been a non-issue. The content would have been a non-issue because every state could have said, okay, what do we need to do to update this content to be aligned with the Common Core? What happened was everybody freaked out because all the content they had was not aligned to the standards that they needed and the publishers first um, lied and cheated and put, put stickers Common Core aligned on the textbooks and actually didn't do any alignment. Uh, and, and I've since confirmed that with some high level publishers. That's what they did. And, and then when people called them on it, then they said, okay, we're working on it. And they still have never really gotten around to it. So what, what that left was, was all these school districts were left without any content. And teachers had been told for 15 years that the way you teach class is that you, t you get the textbook and the instruction manual and, and you teach students this way. And without that, you know, it was interesting that the teachers who were sort of pre No Child Left Behind, so teachers who came in in the 90s and who were, who were, more, who were asked to actually you know, curate content and figure things out, they're, a lot of them are actually really excited now because they get to do that. But the other teachers are scared to death because they, they were never taught to do that. They don't quite know what to do. And it's a, it's a real hassle. I was speaking with my kid's principal, and he was explaining that to me. He said, my, my teachers that are in 15 years or longer, they're loving this. This is great. This is a wide open field for them. My teachers who are 15 years or younger in the field are just like deathly terrified about what's going on. They're really frustrated. So <clears throat> that's a long winding answer to, to say that this is actually an issue that we're, we're working on. It's the other half of kind of what I do. It's not higher ed. Um, but there's, there's an opportunity here that OER can be part of that solution. It's not the solution by any means, but it's certainly part of the solution, part of the infrastructure, and part of the way of thinking that, that could accelerate the progress that we need to make toward making, having teachers be, be seen as the professionals that they are, but also when setting that expectation that teachers are professionals and that they should be expected to do professional work, and faculty as well. I mean, I don't think that's the expectation. It may, that is kind of the expectation we have of faculty, but that we give them no support, training, or incentive. That's the difference in higher ed. And in K-12, we require that they do it, but, but don't actually, uh, well, no, in, in K-12, we ask them not to do that. <laughs> so anyway. And then, I mean, to be fair, there are some ed schools that do a great job of teaching teachers mm -hmm. how to think about writing curriculum and aligning curriculum. There are better that's examples than was, I'm sure, TC, along with the you know, GSE, that was really good. But your teacher has to land somewhere where they're actually allowed to do that. Yep. Well, my child's in a teacher's college school, so uh, aligned public school. So um, I, I like, we are kind of at the end of our time. I'd like to ask um, Timo and Mary Lou if you have some final thoughts. Um, TJ has uh, been able to move us from, um, from the um, object to the human, which I think is the task that George set out for us this morning. I wonder if you all have some closing thoughts also. Yeah, you know, I think what the last question was about, you know, uh, we're, we're looking to empower our students to take responsibility for their learning, and yet we have all these systemic roadblocks to empowering our teachers to take responsibility for their teaching. Um, and I think that's true, you know, whether you're looking at K-12, which obviously has more of them, or higher ed, where there are, are principles and cultural aspects that make it very difficult for student, for teachers to go forward. So what we always try to encourage people is first try it, just open up a little bit and see what happens. Because magic does happen when you become open and that we can all give you examples of very unexpected outcomes. And the second is something that I heard at a conference um, from a superintendent of the Los Angeles community, or, or Los Angeles High School District, and she said, proceed until apprehended. Just keep going. <laughs> um, well, I can't top that. Um, but I'm, I'm quite positive about the future. I think that um, we're debating all the legal issues and the business issues and the value proposition issues, but I think learners are starting to find all kinds of online education, open education. They don't care if it's openly licensed or not, they're using it. So I think that will be the change. Um, and then the teachers will change with it. Um, the first movers, they've started to use materials they found, even if it's not openly licensed, they're starting to use it in their classroom because they're 
students come up with it. So it's already seeping in, and I think that is a good thing. I think this is the end of the symphony, so you can applaud and thank our wonderful panel for their comments. Thank you. Are you going to be here tomorrow, right? Yes, I will be.